Hello everyone, it's Claudia. Welcome back. I am really excited that you're here with me today because we're talking to an incredible physician, Dr. Robert Mathis from Santa Barbara, California, who has made a huge difference in my life. I have talked about Dr. Mathis in one of my previous videos on my journey with HRT, and many of you left questions for him. So today we're going to try to answer all those questions. We will be talking about menopause in general, estrogen, the risks, the advantages, weight gain in menopause, and a bunch of other things. I have never met a physician more passionate about helping his patients and specifically women with their hormones. Dr. Mathis is so passionate about hormones, he's actually writing a book on them. I know you will love him, I know you will learn a lot from him. So without further ado, let's talk to him, as I like to call him, Dr. Bob. Hello, Dr. Mathis. Thank you so much for being here with us. Hi, Claudia. Good to see you. Good to see you too. I have a bunch of questions for you, so let's get right into it. I know you're very passionate about hormones. My first question I have for you is, tell us really briefly what happens as we go into perimenopause and then menopause. So as women, it takes about seven years to get into full menopause. Mm -hmm. And in that process, the progesterone level drops off and the ovulations disappear. So progesterone is the first thing to go. Then what we're left with is a modest level of estradiol and no progesterone or very low progesterones and no ovulations. And for some people, they label that as estrogen dominance. And they're very concerned about that being a time when estrogen, the grow message is just being sent out every day, all day long. And I don't, I don't disagree with that. I think that that's probably what happens. What I do in that case is I give people a little bit of progesterone to balance out the estrogen. So they still have good estradiol but their progesterone is gone, so I give them a little progesterone in a rhythmic fashion. They keep having cycles, and then as the time passes of two or three more years, they'll come back in, and all of a sudden their estrogen is gone, and now we have to give them both estrogen and progesterone. When the hormones go away, then a lot of all the different body systems that are that are signaled by the estrogen and the progesterone don't receive their signal, their message. The collagen messages, the grow collagen, skin messages, brain function messages, estradiol controls energy in the brain. When you lose your hormones, you're losing these messages that promote health and well-being in a vascular system, the heart, the brain, the body tissues, the connective tissues. And, and when estrogen goes away, inflammation seems to rise quite a bit in, in women. And there's a group of women who have, who have get their arthritis. And it seems to come on right in that hazy window of menopause, where menopause kind of starts and the arthritis has been kind of getting worse as the estrogen levels drop. And when they finally get to no estrogen, that's when they, their joint inflammation and pain sort of seem to flare. And then the foods will aggravate that, so we have to be very careful with foods too. I think it's just important to know that that's, that message that the hormones provide to the body the only way that gets that message is from estradiol, bioidentical estradiol. It can get a false message from xenobiotics, which are things that look like hormones, such as BPA, which is in the cans, inside cans, and on all the receipts that we get from the store, they're all BPA coded. So we have to be careful about handling those. So there's false estrogen messages, which can lead to false messaging and false signaling to the cells, which can cause other changes that aren't necessarily favorable. Um, and then there's the absolute absence of, of any kind of message. And for those people, I mean, I have women with estrogen levels of less than five. Wow. And it's just, it's so low. Some people can't function. Yeah. They just, I mean, I had a PhD candidate come in here and she was in, she was in shambles. She just said, I can't do my program. I need to quit. I, I have to, Somebody told me that you know something about hormones and what can I do? So I gave her some hormones and within two weeks, she came in and said, no problem. I can do my program now. I can write my papers. I can do that paper in three days, which would have taken me three weeks before because the brain wasn't working. And she had no stress tolerance. She couldn't, she just couldn't see, see the, the future for the moment. And that's what happens when you get so stressed out that you can't, see down the road you're stuck in this minute and you feel all this pressure and you but with estradiol it empowers women and mm -hmm. when you empower the person they feel so much better they can handle the kids they can handle the grumpy husband when he comes home from work i mean you know it's like yes honey i know you had a hard day i'll be right there i mean you know you just, <laughs> just take care of business maybe i need a little more estrogen <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay good 
<laughs> so I know that you're a proponent of replacing hormones, so am I, but is there a risk if a woman doesn't want to replace her hormones or doesn't feel the need to replace her hormones? What are the risks okay. there? So when I, I have several people who've walked in and said, I'm not doing hormones mm -hmm. and her estrogen level is like less than 15 and it should be 175, 250, somewhere in that area. And, and progesterone should be a number, you know, three to five. The answer is when I look at that person, I see because of the knowledge base that I have about how the hormones affect all the different systems, which we just briefly went over, mm -hmm. I see a person who's going to possibly deteriorate over time. Mm -hmm. The issue is the body is so redundant. There's so many safeguards built into the system because whoever designed a system said it needs to have 10 times the ability to do whatever it's supposed to do because otherwise you can't run down the street and get away from the dinosaur. So we can ramp up our cardiac output 10 to 20 times greater. We can ramp up all these other systems. We can stay awake for days, take a little cat naps and, and keep working if there's something has to be taken care of. Not forever, which some people try to do, then they crash and burn. But the body's redundancy allows us to think we can get away without the hormones. And so we'll go for five or 10 years We'll get to be 70. They're, they're, this happens at 50, and all of a sudden, they're 20 years later at 70. And now they're starting to notice word finding issues. They're having difficulty with memory. They feel a little stressed. You know, they're driving the car, and they feel like they're, it's a little harder to drive because they feel like that car is next to them a little too close. Whatever. I mean, it's just, it's the world isn't the same without the hormones, the way they interpret, the way they feel in the world. So that happens at 70. By the time they're 75 to 80, now we're kind of heading into that Alzheimer's dementia kind of area. 80% of dementia patients, Alzheimer's patients, are women. Wow. Why is that? Because they're without their hormones for 40 years before it happens. 30 years before it happens. So it takes that long to really notice. Okay. So some people would say, well, it's going to take 30 years. I don't need to worry about this. I'll, I'll just do this. I won't worry about getting cancer. Well, we can explore that topic too. Yeah. Real briefly, what about the bones on the heart health? How is that affected so, by the loss of hormones and not replacing the, them? The, when I have women who have osteopenia or osteoporosis, if I put them on rhythmic hormones, it takes about 18 months to rebuild the bones. Mm -hmm. So you'll see a person go from minus three on their T-score all the way back up to minus one. It's, it's amazing. The first time I saw that, I was... Well, I was just, you know, as a as an allopathically trained physician, I can't believe that I just reversed osteoporosis. But the answer is, I did. I mean, I didn't do it. The estrogen did it. I, all I did was promote the estrogen in a pro, in a positive way to the to the woman, and she chose to use it. And then her bone density on t testing in two years later was normal. Yeah. And what do you do with that? I mean, how do you? How do you take that information and ignore it? No, I can't do that. I mean, if my goal is to help patients and my goal is to take care of the patients and optimize their health, then I must pay attention to the fact that I've just taken bioidentical hormones and optimized their health to the point where cardiac health, brain health, vascular health, connective tissue health, all these things related to hormones, when I get done writing the book on estradiol, it'll all be in there, all the different systems and how it affects them. What, one little chapter after another, you know, neurologically speaking, works better with estradiol. Helps manage swan cells and so forth. The gut, the GI bacteria, the gut mm -hmm. microbiome is different in women with hormones than it is without hormones. Mm -hmm. Bad guys move in and take up housekeeping when you lose your hormones. Interesting. So... It becomes time to face the truth. And it's it's tough as an allopath to look at integrated medicine and see how much good we do over here on this side with all these tools compared to give somebody an antidepressant. I have a 78-year-old woman who is who was told to stop her antidepressant after 10 or 12 years, just stop it by her doctor. And as a matter of fact, that stopping caused her to go into a terrible place because you can't stop antidepressants. You have to taper them off. 
and I'm trying, the family brought her in here, and I'm trying to help her get off. She had to go back on them, and I'm trying to help her get off of them while she's still alive, mm -hmm. if we can, and make well, her feel like a whole person. Let's talk about that really fast. You brought up antidepressants. A lot of women, when they go into menopause, are being put on antidepressants because right. we get depressed, we get anxious, we can't sleep. What is the connection there between the loss of hormones and those things? So estradiol manages an enzyme that stops the breakdown of serotonin. When you lose your estrogen, now the body can break down serotonin. So it makes sense to give people an antidepressant which raises serotonin levels when they're in menopause. It doesn't fix the problem. In fact, the antidepressants create a depletion of serotonin in time and create a secondary problem, which is what this 78-year-old is having. She got so depleted in serotonin that when they stopped the drug abruptly, they created a huge problem for her with side effects. She doesn't feel like herself. She's very confused and so forth and so on. So estrogen helps raise serotonin, helps provide more sleep, which allows for less depression. Provide more sleep allows for more better function so you don't get so depressed. I mean, when you can't do what you want to do and you can't remember what you're supposed to be doing, I mean, who doesn't get depressed? Yeah. So these mechanisms are clear. And when you give people, I mean, I've had people come in here and not sleeping a couple hours a day. She was sleeping two hours a day. Now she's sleeping five hours a day. But <laughs> gave her a dribble of estradiol. I mean, it's just a little tiny bit for a 78-year-old. And it's just that's all it took to just help her feel a little better and that's well, the goal when, when i met you i couldn't sleep at all either so you have helped me dramatically right. with that through hormones right. yeah. but so we talked about the risk of not replacing hormones i think so many women are afraid of replacing hormones because of the potential risks right. cancer and can we talk a little bit about that what okay. what is your opinion on that so i've been replacing hormones now for about 14 years mm -hmm. And what I've seen is that, number one is I've had about four cases of cancer in 14 years, which isn't much compared to a 2,000 population of patients. That's not much at all. Mm -hmm. And from one point of view, cancer is an insidious, probably a genetic aberration that happens. Inflammation, inf more inflammation, more inflammation changes the genes. The genes become wacky, so to speak, and the cells don't function the way they're supposed to. They just start reproducing and they don't, there's no control. All right, so that's cancer. That's not caused by hormones because if estrogen was would cause cancer, then all pregnant women would die. That's true. Estrogen levels in pregnancy are over 3,000. Wow. Estrogen levels in normal young women are somewhere in the 185 to 325, 395 range depending on the person. So hormones don't seem to be the cause of cancer because otherwise all these young women, they all be dead. Every month they'd have these estrogen peaks and they go, eh, that another one died. But that's <laughs> not what's happening. <laughs> okay. And pregnant women, oh my God. One woman came in here and she said, I don't feel quite right. What the? So we checked her, her estrogen level and it turns out that it was over 3,000. Wow. I said, I have good news. You're pregnant. She said, oh, <laughs> really? Okay, good. <laughs> so 3,000 is, well, that's a lot of estrogen. Yeah. But it's balanced with progesterone during the pregnancy, where progesterone will go up to 50 or some other number like that. So that balance is, that's the balance of the bioidentical hormones that keeps things functioning within the genetic framework of how it's supposed to work. If we obey the genes, we do better overall than if we don't. And you also told me you have a friend who is an oncologist who has looked at this, the breast cancer risk and right. estrogen. Tell us a little bit so, about that. Um, a local oncologist here in town, Dr. Taguchi, and she has done a study now over the last, well, since I've known her, about 15 years. And what she's found is that in her population of patients who have breast cancer, the ones who start using hormones after the breast cancer surgery, they're the patients who have fewer recurrences. People who don't use hormones seem to have more recurrence. So that's that's interesting. Yeah. And then there's a big study that was done around 2001, and it showed with, I think, 50,000 women that, that even synthetic estrogen 
had fewer cancers than women who took no hormones in the control group. So again, it's the idea is estrogen is just, it's a signaling molecule that tells the body what to do. It's not the cause of, it just promotes cells that have estrogen receptors. So I looked at it with these people that I had, I said, you know, the estrogen woke that thing up to the point where it was small and it was growing kind of quietly and it was going to be insidious and just take over the person's life. And then we would find it five years later and go, oh my God, you've got metastases all over the body. That's too late. We need to know now. So, so it, I it, think it could accelerate it ex woke up existing the cancer. cancer, but it doesn't right. cause it. Mm -hmm. It didn't cause it, but it did help it grow faster. And then, you know, it became visible sooner. Why did these five women get a cancer, four or five women, when the other 2,000 didn't? Well, something was there, some genetic aberration, inflammation, chemicals and toxins. We have mold toxins, chemical toxins. We have just plain old stress. So the answer is all these factors are what caused all the inflammation, which led to the aberrant cell growth. Mm -hmm. And... The hormones only do what they're supposed to do. They make the cells grow because that's what they do. They refresh the tissue on a month-to-month -month basis. Every month, a woman's body gets ready to have another pregnancy. Whether they do or not, but they still get ready. Once a month, the woman's body gets ready. Women go on the hormones after not being on them for years, and they'll call and say, I have breast tenderness. And the answer is, the first two or three months, the breasts are rebuilding themselves. They're rebuilding all the tissues that have died off and re revitalizing the breast tissue. You're revitalizing the whole body. You're re revitalizing the sex organs. You're revitalizing the breast. You're the revitalizing bones, the, brain, the skin. The skin. The skin is amazing yeah. what happens to women with hormone estrogen. It, it, it fluffs up the skin and gets rid of some of the wrinkles, many of the wrinkles, because it helps hold the moisture that's lost when people go into medical. Yeah. So, Dr. Mathis, if a woman doesn't want to take hormone replacement, is there anything she can do naturally to help her with those symptoms, with the loss of hormones? So, the Chinese found a solution. What they did is they had pregnant women bring their urine over to this place, and they would take the urine and put it on a rug, so to speak, or on a flat surface, and let it dry out. And then they would scrape the powder off the carpet and then the older women would drink the powder. So that's one way. In other words, they were using, well, the estrogen in a pregnant woman's urine is very high. So that's how they got estrogen into older women. They just take the urine and dry it out and use the powder. Okay, that's just is an that idea. Is that true or is that you that's making true. that up? That's 100% true. <laughs> okay. okay. So number two, uh, there's actually um, Beswicken is a company that has some uh, tablets you can take, progesterone and estrogen-like tablets. And then at the health food store, you can get progesterone in a pump, a bottle, pump bottle, and you can put on some progesterone. And then I think there's also some estrogen out there nowadays, uh, low-dose estradiol, um, which is, it's okay. It's probably not going to do the trick for, for a lot of people. It may help people who are less sensitive to the loss of the hormones, but in general, the best, and then it probably won't do much for the bone density because you really do have to have the rhythmic building the bones, break the bone down, build the bones in order to get the whole thing to work. I mean, the body is a, it's a hormonal rhythmic device. It's a biological unit that runs on rhythms and cycles. Hormones are part of life, unfortunately. So, Dr. Mathis, since we are talking about doing things a little bit more naturally, what impact do you think nutrition and also lifestyle has on the symptoms of menopause? Nutrition is how the body works. We need cofactors. We need proteins. We need modest fat intake. We need modest carbohydrates intake. We need the nutrition and the vitamins and minerals and the micronutrients to provide the liver and the body systems with the ability to manage their protein metabolism, their fat metabolism, and so forth. We need these, this nutrition to make everything work right. So it's best to have vegetables and fruits to get your nutrition if you can. 
if you're not a vegetable person, then you're going to have to do something about that. And if you don't like green leafy vegetables, <laughs> then you're missing out on a lot of micronutrients. I look at those foods and I think to myself, it's amazing that Mother Nature has taken all this nutrition and pushed it up into these plants mm -hmm. from the soil. And how did that, how does this happen? And it's just amazing. Just look at, look at any piece of food and tell yourself, look at all that nutrition that's in that food for us to consume so we can survive. Mm -hmm. And that's why growing plants, growing crops is so important and how they're grown is so important. The organic farming that's coming back from the last 20 years is starting to get a good foothold on the crops. And so now we have, at least where we live, we have organic and inorganic products. The chemicals and toxins that are part of our world now are very difficult for us to metabolize, consume a lot of our nutrition just to metabolize toxins. We may need to supplement some of that nutrition to keep up with the demand. Glutathione, NAC, zinc, selenium, we may need more of these things because we're under, so to speak, under attack from all the other things in our world, all the chemicals and toxins and the mold toxins. So people do better if they eat a really good, highly nutritious diet, not so much how much they eat, but just getting the foods that are grown as organically as possible with as little spraying as possible. But you definitely find that nutrition has an impact on menopause. Nutrition helps make people, well, for some women, they do better. Then there's a group of women who basically, it doesn't matter what happens, when their hormones are gone, they're gone with them. Mm -hmm. So you got to do your best. I mean, there's people who can stretch menopause and feel better with nutrition and sleep. And there's always going to be a place for nutrition in our life because we are a nutritional, I mean, just think about it. You're going to eat that apple and it's going to turn into energy it's going to release its vitamins b and b vitamins and c and so forth and that's going to i can't even fathom how it all works it just blows, <laughs> blows my mind that yeah. we can eat food and it gets processed and we get all this nutrition from the food sometimes it's incredible it really <laughs> <laughs> so dr bob if a woman wants to take hormones is there a window of opportunity let's say she's 45 when she goes in menopause now she's 55 has she missed her window of opportunity to go on the hormone, or is there not a window? There are people who advocate for using hormones for the first five or ten years after menopause, mm -hmm. or from menopause on. There's a group that have talked like this. There's a group that talk about the window that you're describing. Um, in, in my experience with the education I have, any time is a good time to start a hormone, especially if you start slowly. Okay. So you need you need a practitioner who understands that there's no need to rush. You've been without hormones for 10 years. What's the rush? Mm -hmm. Let's just put on a little bit and let's let you get used to this little bit of hormone because you're going to just, it's like you're going to start the machine up again. And it's got some cobwebs. It's, it's you know, it's got a little dust on it. You got to start slow. So go, go low dose and start slow, and you should do just fine. Okay. And the fact that all these different systems are going to thrive with the presence of the hormone that wasn't there, it's amazing how people feel. Low dose, go slow, and I don't think there's, in my world, I don't think there's a window. Okay. You just mentioned a good practitioner. That was another question I got is how do you find a good practitioner? Oh. I've had so many women ask me, my doctor is not helping me, what should I do? How do you find a good practitioner? Well, that's a good question. I, I don't I don't know how to... You know, it's... it's uh, is somebody that has passion is a good probably going to be a good practitioner. Mm -hmm. And someone who has the patient's interest at heart is going to be a good practitioner. Uh, it helps to have a lot of education. I don't expect people to, to go to as many lectures as I've been to, but the more the better. And then I would read the comments about a physician. Some of those are reliable. In other words, I have a, when people look at my comments, they see a lot of very good remarks from the patients. And that just implies that the patients feel comfortable and that they're, they feel like they're getting something. They're, they're feeling better because 
what we're doing is working and the and the connection the, the human connection is there i don't yeah. look at the computer when i'm with a patient i look at the patient <laughs> yeah well you were the first person when i was struggling that actually after having gone to eight different doctors that looked at me at me not at my file or anything and said right. let's help you and that alone even if you wouldn't have helped me which you did greatly it made all the difference in the world so it's that, nice that, thank you it's nice if they take phone calls. Mm -hmm. you know, I take phone calls because people with hormones need help. Yeah. We really have to help women understand how to use them, what to do when certain things happen, early bleeding, whatever. We need to understand. So I try to take the calls as often as I can, and that's very, very helpful. Now, that's not something a lot of practitioners want to do, and it's a lot of work. But it gives a very good comfort comfortable feeling when you can get a hold of your practitioner and ask him a simple question it takes a minute yeah. and then we're done. and then she feels a lot better or he feels a lot better they know what they want to do well i will definitely link your information below in the description box and anybody living in california can reach out sure. to you because well today i think it's anywhere you're now. amazing because telemedicine okay. is open so we can actually you know in theory we can treat people anywhere okay great that's good to know Awesome. I have one more question for you that just came up recently. I have a subscriber who is actually on hormones, but has her doctor has never taken any blood tests since she's been on the hormones for the last six years. And okay. she has gained a lot of weight since she's on the hormones. Her diet hasn't changed. She's very active, but she has gained about, I think, 25 pounds. So what could, why, first of all, why do women gain weight when they go into menopause? And what could the weight gain be when on hormones? So weight gain in menopause makes sense because without estrogen, it changes your insulin sensitivity. And basic, basically, people become insulin intolerant. They, they just don't, their insulin isn't utilized the way it should be. So therefore, the body puts out more insulin. And the more insulin you put out, the more weight you can gain. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's well known that diabetes patients gain weight when they start taking insulin. You have to be very careful about how much insulin you give them. I listened to a, a lecture last weekend, and they talked. He talked about using a product that raises nitric oxide. The nitric oxide can sit on this GLUT4 receptor and activate that receptor and help make you more sensitive to insulin and help prevent the weight gain. Mm -hmm. So apparently, some people have lost weight using this product. It's called Neo40, N-E-O, the number 40, mm -hmm. and it raises your nitric oxide level. Other things that can raise nitric oxide include green leafy vegetables, and in some cases, beets are thought to have raised nitric oxide, not to mention exercise and so forth. So the answer is, um, it seems like there's a key, there's many, many, many parts to the puzzle, but this is just a part of it. Once you get the estrogen back on board, estrogen, I've had a few women who gained enormous amounts of weight on estradiol. Now, it's not common. Um, but one or two gained about the 25 you're talking about. So they basically had to quit. And I'm not sure why they gained so much weight. That's not clear to me. Um, but they had to stop or use very low doses to, to go forward. So you're saying that's not the norm, that women, when they are no. on estrogen, gain weight. It two is more the norm to gain weight when they're not on estrogen. Two to three pounds, and it's basically water weight. Okay. Estrogen is actually an anorectic. So when women take estradiol, in theory, they don't eat as much food. Okay. Progesterone, on the other hand, can make people eat, but estrogen. And then, as it would be with life itself, everything can be the opposite of what you just, what I just said. Mm -hmm. You know, some people estrogen makes them eat. So it's it's a losing battle to try to figure out exactly what's going to happen. You just have to take that person and try things with them, and remember that their uniqueness requires that you attend to them specifically for their particular needs. Mm -hmm. Next person over here whole different story. I would imagine that testing is also very important. This woman told me she has never had a blood tested since she's been on hormones. I would, minimum is probably one to two times a year at least, just to make sure the hormones are stable. And for her to gain so much weight, I would want to be looking at a number of other things and look at her diabetic risk and look at her hormone. Maybe her estrogen is too high or too low. Well, this was really awesome, Dr. Mathis. I have talked to you so many times and every time I talk to you I learn something new is there I seriously do is that I love talking to you is there anything else you would like to add anything else you think is important I just think that that we as as 
biological units, we need to understand that we need our life cycle, our lifestyle to be managed the best we can. Try to get as much sleep as you need. And don't pretend you need six hours because we all really need seven and a half sleep cycles. And that works out to about eight hours. And in the winter time, there are some people who have written some literature that says that we used to sleep nine or ten hours in the winter. Well, let me find a job that I can do that with because <laughs> most of us don't have that much time to sleep. Nutrition is extremely important. I mean, what are we trying to do? We're just trying to optimize, have the best day you can have, feel as good as you can feel. And when it's time for you to go, well, then you're going to go. But in general, I just want to be awake and alert and be able to be there for my loved ones and for my patients and for our society because the happier person radiates happiness and the unhappy people radiate the opposite. <laughs> so <laughs> if, we can, if we can be beacons of light, then we're doing a lot better in terms of spreading the, the bright light around. That is true. And you definitely do. Thank you so much for this. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dr. Mathis. Like I said, it's such a pleasure to talk to you. And I always learn something new when I talk to you. Thank sure. you so much for being here with us. Okay. All right. We'll see you later. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye.